In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The passage we have today uh, from Genesis, this passage from the 22nd chapter of Genesis is, it's a tough passage. It's also a famous and critically important passage in Scripture. So today I just want to focus on Genesis. Now we've been following our, our hero, Abraham, uh, and Sarah, the last few weeks as we read forward in Genesis, right? We know that Abraham is supposed to be our hero. We are a member of that family of faith called the Abrahamic faith, the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Well, we know we're supposed to be rooting for Abraham, but we saw last week that sometimes it's tough to root for Abraham and Sarah, right? We heard last week about Abraham sending Hagar and Ishmael out into the wilderness without enough food or water. We were honest about the fact that Abraham may be our hero, but he has plenty of flaws, like most of us, all of us. In, in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, we're going to have our qualms, I think, with Abraham. Again, it's a strange story, a harrowing story. It's known in English as the binding of Isaac. In Hebrew, it's often called simply the Akedah, Akedah being the Hebrew word for binding, for when Abraham actually ties his son down on the wood. And the story is relatively straightforward, even if perplexing and troubling. Abraham receives a, a vision or an instruction from God to sacrifice his son. And Abraham, being faithful and loyal and obedient, decides, okay, I guess. One assumes he was a little bit worried, but he responded. He took his son up a hill. He bound his son, prepared him for sacrifice, took the knife in his hand, was ready to kill his only son. And all of a sudden, God came back with an addendum, right? Wait a second. Never mind. Don't do it. The story has a happy ending of, of sorts. It could have been much less happy. We might say that. But the whole thing is a bit strange and confusing. What is going on here? Why does the Bible invoke child sacrifice? Why does God invoke child sacrifice? You know, we're told at the very beginning of the text that this is a test. And here I will, I will bring up the uh, passage again. Those of you on the phone might want to turn back to page uh, five. Right, the very opening of this passage says, God tested Abraham. And this is the traditional interpretation that, you know, God was never serious about this. God didn't actually want Abraham to sacrifice his son. It was a test to ensure that Abraham was faithful, loyal, and obedient. I have to say, this interpretation has never quite sat right with me. For one thing, Abraham was faithful in everything else that he did. For the most part, when, it, when God called him to do something, Abraham did it. He went on into the wilderness. He accepted the covenants that God offered him on two different occasions. Why would God need another test? And, and why would the God of love and life, the God of mercy and compassion, even pretend to suggest that child sacrifice was something that God would want? Surely there's another way that God could have tested Abraham than even suggesting this awful and terrible act, suggesting an act that many of us would see as in conflict with God's love. In truth, there are two big elements of Abraham's story in Genesis that have always sort of confused and worried me. This story is definitely one of them. Why would God even suggest or pretend to suggest child sacrifice? The God I know who is revealed in Jesus Christ would never even hint at child sacrifice. Now, the other aspect of Abraham's story that has often confused me is actually a passage that we, we haven't read in our cycle this year. It's Genesis chapter 12, and it, it describes Abraham leaving his home. And I'll just summarize it briefly. I don't want us to get too deep into reading through multiple passages of Scripture this morning. In the beginning of chapter 12 of Genesis, God just comes to Abraham. He's called Abram then. But he comes to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, get up and go 
leave your home and leave your family. And if you do this, you will have descendants. You will have sons. You will have heirs. And it always struck me as odd because God doesn't give any reason that Abram needed to leave his home. He's told that he'll have children, but certainly he could have children in his home village, right? And certainly it would be much easier to raise children with the help of aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins, rather than to head off hundreds of miles into the wilderness and try to raise a family in a dangerous and hostile world. What's going on here? I've always thought that there must have been more to that story, that it wasn't recorded in scripture, but there must have been something about Abraham's home that made it not good, not safe, not possible for him to remain there and actually worship God. The text doesn't tell us anything, but there are lots of areas of scripture where I wish it said more. And this is one of those times. There must be more to this story. I want to propose today an interpretation of the binding of Isaac that I think can actually answer both of these questions. But before we get there, we do need to set the scene. The fact of the matter is, as surprising as it may be for us to hear, child sacrifice was known in the ancient Middle East. There is historical and archaeological evidence for the practice of child sacrifice being relatively widespread over the sort of Eastern Mediterranean. What is today sort of Egypt, parts of North Africa, Israel, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Turkey. Throughout this region, it looks like child sacrifice was on occasion practiced. Now, of course, it wasn't common, right? No society that commonly practiced child sacrifice would exist very long, of course. But it does seem that it was widespread in that it was practiced only rarely, but by a relatively large number of cultures. And it looks like this is the way it worked. Under a time of extraordinary crisis, say a war was going really badly, or there was a terrible famine in the land, or there was some kind of awful disease that was spreading everywhere, it seems that in these times of crisis, some religious communities believe that in order to secure more divine assistance, and these people would have been polytheists, so they would have had many different gods and goddesses that they worshipped, that in order to receive more divine assistance from the gods, they had to offer a very valuable sacrifice. It was sort of like an exchange, right? If you want better service, you pay more. And what could be more valuable to a family than their children. And so in these times of extreme crisis, again, not often, but in moments of extraordinary difficulty, a community might come together and select one child to be offered as a sacrifice in order to placate the gods and prevent the war or the famine or the disease from destroying the whole community. So this strange story of child sacrifice in scripture actually has historical and archeological precedent. It's a believable story. Remember that we uh, honor Abraham as perhaps the first monotheist, maybe in the whole world, the first monotheist. But if Abraham was the first monotheist, that means presumably he was born into a family of not monotheists, of, of polytheists, of people who may have been in a religious community that rarely but on occasion ch practiced child sacrifice in times of crisis. And then I, as I was reading even more closely this week, I noticed something. And we're going to get a little bit into Hebrew translation here, but, but stick with me. If you notice here at the beginning of our passage, it says God tested Abraham. And indeed, throughout the, the Torah, the first five books of scripture, and throughout most of the Hebrew Bible, what we Christians sometimes call the Old Testament, there are two main terms that you'll see uh, for God. One of them is God, with a capital G, but the other is, and let me find it down here for you, the other is the Lord. We'll frequently see this, this term, the Lord, which also refers to the one true God, the creator God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we have these two different words, God and the Lord. And indeed, these are translations of two different Hebrew terms. God is a translation of the Hebrew Elohim, Elohim. And Elohim in Hebrew 
and there are different variants grammatically, but this word Elohim indeed just means God. And just like the English word God, it can mean capital G God, or it could be lowercase g God. Indeed, the same word can actually mean God's plural. It's the same word. There's nothing different about it in the text. It's context that tells the reader whether it means God with a capital G, the one true God, or one God of a polytheistic religion, like it could be used to talk about Zeus or uh, Mars or some other polytheistic deity. And indeed, it could even mean multiple gods altogether, the same word. So the reader of Hebrew has to be smart and pay attention and think deeply about what this word means. Now, the word the Lord is different. The word that's translated as the Lord here refers to a name that is given specifically to the God of Israel. I'm not going to get into the details of it. When we get to Exodus chapter 3, we'll talk more about this in a few weeks. But when we see the Lord like this, we know that it's referring specifically to the one true creator of God. There's no ambiguity there. And so this is what I wonder. I wonder if this story records this deep memory of a crisis that Abraham and his family and his community faced. I wonder if at the beginning when it says God tested Abraham, I wonder if it actually should read something more like the gods tested Abraham. Or the religious community that Abraham was in said that the gods we're going to test Abraham, right? I wonder if that capital G should be a lowercase g, and maybe plural too. Here's what I'm wondering. Perhaps Abraham, who's living in, in northern Mesopotamia, what is today Syria, probably, eastern Syria. He's living there, and there's some kind of crisis. There's a war, there's a famine, there's disease. Maybe all three, they frequently come together. They face this terrible crisis. The community's existence is being threatened. So the elders gather together and they decide that they need to offer a child sacrifice. It wasn't common in their culture, but it was acceptable under extreme circumstances. So the elders draw lots and Abraham, or Abram, gets the short stick. The decision is he must sacrifice his son, Isaac. And of course he's heartbroken but he also lives in a culture that teaches him that this act will save his people. And he thinks, surely it's right to sacrifice one person to save hundreds of people. And so as heartbroken as he is, he agrees. And the next day, he marches up this hill where these sacrifices would have been offered. And he binds his son and he gets the knife out and he's ready to do this awful thing. But he's deeply conflicted, of course, as any good parent would be in this moment. He's deeply stressed. He, he, he thinks this is the right thing to do, but there's something telling him otherwise. And in this moment where he has the knife, it is then that genuine revelation from God, in here with a capital G, genuine revelation comes to Abraham. And God says, no, no, stop what you're doing. This is not what true divinity wants. You've been deceived. You are confused. In other words, I wonder if this is actually the moment where Abraham actually converts, that this is the birth of monotheism, that until this, Abraham had been conflicted in his religious views. But it's in this moment where he realizes that God does not desire child sacrifice, that he actually recognizes the falsehood of polytheism and becomes a monotheist on that hill with a knife in his hand, realizing that God is always the God of love and life and mercy. Now I know that this is a strange reading of the text. Notice that I'm not only sort of changing a little bit how we read Genesis 22, but I'm also gonna place it uh, earlier in Abraham's story. I mentioned Genesis 12 when Abraham leaves. And I wonder if this scene, the binding of Isaac, is why Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac have to leave their home. Presumably, if Abraham, Abraham came down this hill and his son was still alive, his community would have been upset. He was supposed to offer the sacrifice. He was supposed to save the community, and he didn't. Perhaps they would have tried to take Isaac by force to sacrifice him. Maybe they even would have tried to kill Abraham and Sarah. So when God says at the beginning 
of Genesis 12, that you need to leave here if you want descendants. God is just pointing out the obvious, because these people are going to come after you, and they're going to hurt you. Now, I know that this is a strange reading of the text, and it does create its own problems in reading other parts of Genesis. Even the binding of Isaac, there are questions that are raised. You know, the, the, what the angel of the Lord actually says sits in tension with what I'm offering. But, but I think that my reading answers more questions than it raises, right? It allows us to say unequivocally that God never wants child sacrifice. God would never even suggest or pretend to want child sacrifice. God is always the God of life and love and mercy and compassion. It also, of course, allows us to uh, exonerate Abraham a bit here, right? He goes up the hill because he thinks it's the right thing to do to protect his community, but he also has the courage to change course in this moment of crisis. And this moment, like I said, becomes this moment of radical conversion. Not only the birth of monotheism, right? Abraham doesn't only recognize that there's only one God, but we would say the birth of ethical monotheism. That is that God has ethics, that God wants us to act in a good way, and that God doesn't ask violence from us. Now, as I said, my reading of this passage is definitely a minority view. And it does create some other problems in reading the text, which we can talk about in the Sunday Forum if, if you all want. I don't want to get lost there now. I know this sermon is already going on a little bit long for us in the Episcopal Church. But I really do think that this reading of the Akedah, this reading of the binding of Isaac, seeing the opening as a moment where Abraham is actually being influenced by, uh, not by God, but by this, this other polytheistic religion, that he's being influenced by voices that some of us might even call demonic. And that it's in the moment when God stops Abraham that we actually hear the genuine voice of divine revelation. And that this explains why Abraham had to leave. I think that this makes Abraham's story fit together even better. But it doesn't just, it doesn't just teach us something about our faith. It doesn't just uh, teach us something about who Abraham was. It doesn't just teach us something about who God really is. It, it tells us something about how we should act in our own lives, right? Because like Abraham, we will face moments of crisis. We will face moments of difficulty. And we also will have to make choices, right? Will we give in to all those voices calling for violence? Will we listen to the demonic voices? Or will we embrace life in love, no matter what? The truth of the matter is as strange as child sacrifice, as human sacrifice might seem when we read it in this text. The truth is that our society has been practicing human sacrifice for centuries. We don't normally call it that, right? But we have. Consider, for example, the more than 5,000 African Americans who have been lynched in this country since the end of the Civil War alone. In many of these cases, white people would come together in their hundreds to witness the execution and they would celebrate it. When you read about these awful events or you see some of the pictures, it has the nature of a religious ceremony. It's a ritual. It's not only a ritual in which violence is applied African-Americans. It's also a ritual in which white people worship themselves in the exercise of their own power. If anything is demonic or satanic, certainly a lynching is. And if you think I'm going too far by calling lynching a religious ritual, just consider this fact. There's a quote from a book called the Cross and the Lynching Tree by Dr. James Cohn of, of Blessed Memory, who taught at Union Theological Seminary in New York City for many decades. And in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, he quotes a white man from the South in the early 20th century who said, lynching is a part of the religion of my people. That, those aren't Cohn's words. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of a man who participated in lynching. Lynching is a part of the religion of my people. This is human 
sacrifice. This is demonic, satanic activity. And it wasn't that long ago. Indeed, we know that lynching or the equivalent of lynching continues right up until today. We face moments of crisis. How will we respond? And I want to speak especially, of course, to white people like myself. How will we respond? The knife is in our hand. Isaac is bound there on the funeral pyre. What will we do? You know, in, in the Akedah, in the binding of Isaac, Abraham becomes, becomes really close to going from being a questionable hero to an outright villain, right? He comes really close to being a villain in this story. But in the moment of decision, he has the courage to take another path. He has the courage to hear God's voice, the true God's voice, the God revealed in uh, the, the law of Moses, the God revealed in the prophets, the God revealed in and through and as Jesus Christ. He has the courage with a knife in his hand to change course. Today, America is still sacrificing human beings in awful religious ceremonies. Even if we don't normally call them that, I think they are. The knife is in our hand. God is trying to speak to us. Will we listen? 